Last week, we started a brand new series that we're calling Fresh Start, and we're talking about how we can biblically experience a new beginning, and I'm looking forward to being in Exodus today, Exodus chapter 4, and if you're there, would you say amen? amen. Exodus chapter 4 and verse number 1, the Bible says this, and Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and he caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe. Everybody say, Believe that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. For a few minutes today, I'd like to speak to this subject, getting unstuck, getting unstuck. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll dive in this morning. Lord, thank you so much for this time that we have to come together and to focus and prioritize your word. And Lord, I pray that we would have a heart of surrender and a heart of submission this morning as we look to your word, that as you speak to us, I pray that we would respond in a way that's pleasing to you. Lord, I pray that you would remove any distractions in the room today, any distractions online today, so that we can glean exactly what you have for us from your word. And Lord, I pray that you would be pleased and magnified in it all. We love you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said this morning, my oldest daughter, Liv, turned 10 recently. And for her birthday, she wanted to go to Universal Studios. And so we decided to take her to Universal, and we were having a great day. And uh, it, it had been a while since I'd been to Universal Studios, and there's kind of a lot of new things and, and uh, new lands. And uh, my daughter Liv wanted to ride this one particular ride, this new Harry Potter ride. And so she, I'm getting a lot of amens from the Harry Potter section over here, and I'm going to try to speak to you guys for a minute. And... Uh, and uh, she was excited about riding this Harry Potter ride, and uh, I was impressed with the ride. It was a pretty cool ride. The technology was pretty uh, advanced in it, and they had screens and animatronics and all different things. And halfway through the ride, though, I started to get very sick. How many of you ever get motion sickness riding rides like that? This was one of these rides that was just kind of going up and down and wobbling you everywhere, and, and it was kind of neat for a second, but after a few minutes, I was like, please get me off this ride. Like, I, I've, I've had enough, and as soon as I was thinking that, I kid you not, the ride came to a screeching halt. The lights came on, and they said, we're having technical difficulties, and uh, and I'm thankful that they have technical difficulties at Universal Studios and at Rock Hill Church, you know, sometimes. So, and they said, we're having technical difficulties. And we were just kind of stuck hanging there, our feet dangling. And I was like, this is my worst nightmare. I'm going to throw up all of our Hogwarts. This is not going to be good. And, uh, and so I'm like, please just get us off this ride. And, and thankfully, a few minutes later, they came back on. They started the ride again. And we were able to get off, get off that ride. And I thought about that. And I thought, you know, nobody in life likes that feeling of being stuck, uh, that, that feeling of, man, I want to move forward in 2024, but I just feel like I can't seem to put one foot in front of the other. I, I want to have a fresh start in my marriage. I want to have a fresh start in my parenting. I want to have a fresh start in my finances and in my relationships, but it just seems like I can't seem to, to move forward. I saw this video last year that, that was a humorous video of a, of a sheep that got stuck, and uh, I thought the video was humorous, and it also is somewhat indicative of our human nature, and I brought it for us to check out this morning. (laughs) Right back in the ditch. How many of you can resonate with that? Like, freedom, fresh start, New year, things are going great, back in the ditch, right? Like I thought I was doing good, and then right back into the ditch where I started. And you know, sometimes, sometimes spiritually it can be exhausting when you're trying to move forward, but you find yourself back in the same spot that you were a few days before. Tragically, many Christians, many followers of Jesus, they don't experience the freedom that Jesus has provided for us. Many Christians stay trapped in anxiety, they stay 
trapped in insecurity. They stay trapped in temptation, trapped in sin, trapped in fear, and we struggle often to move forward. And so the question that I have for us today at the 930 service is, what do we do when we feel stuck and we're not sure how to move forward? How do we respond when we feel trapped and we want to move forward, but it just seems like we can't quite figure it out? The Bible has this to say in Psalm chapter 40, verse number two. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings. I'm so thankful today that when I feel stuck, I can remember that I worship the God who specializes in search and rescue, the God who can pull me up out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and he can set my feet on a rock where there is some stability in my life life. And not only does he give me stability, then he establishes my goings. He provides direction for my future so I know which way to go moving forward. Now, this morning, we're going to see a picture of this. And it's a dramatic picture. It's found in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 4. And we come to the life of Moses. And Moses is somewhat of a larger than life character in scripture. The Bible has so much to say about Moses. And and, uh, we find Moses and he is stuck spiritually. We find Moses in Exodus chapter 4, and he is stuck in stagnation. If you study the life of Moses, his life can interestingly be compartmentalized into three sections, three sections of 40 years. He spent 40 years as a prince in Egypt. He spent 40 years as a shepherd in Midian. And then he spent 40 years as God's leader to bring the people of Israel uh, out of bondage in Egypt. And so when we come to Exodus chapter 3 and 4, Moses is in that, in that middle stage where he is how the Bible describes on the backside of the desert, and he is stuck being a shepherd with his father-in-law in Midian. Now, the reason he was stuck is because, if you might recall, Moses killed a guy. Moses was a murderer, and so Moses didn't want to get caught, so he lived life on the run, and uh, he was there for 40 years. In fact, the Bible says this in Exodus chapter 3, verse number 1. It says, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And so it's in this moment right here in Exodus chapter 3, it's in this moment that after 40 years, God is about to get Moses' attention in a very real and dramatic way. Uh, God is about to speak to Moses in a miraculous way through the burning bush that was not consumed. How many of you remember the story of the burning bush? God's going to speak out and cry out to Moses. Not only is God going to give Moses this miraculous picture of the burning bush, but God is also going to give to Moses his covenant name, Yahweh. Moses says, who who should I say sent me? And he says, say, I am hath sent thee. Uh, That is the covenant name for God. Yahweh, it means the self-existent one, the eternally existent one, the immutable one, the all-powerful one. Who sent you, Moses? Tell them, Yahweh, I am hath sent thee. And so not only does God give him this miraculous sight of the burning bush, and not only does God give him his covenant name, then he puts a clear call on Moses' life and says, I want you to go back to Egypt to lead my people out of captivity. And after all of that, after God shows him the miraculous, and after God reveals his covenant name, and after God gives him clear direction for his future, what's astounding is Moses stays stuck. After all that, we come to chapter four, and Moses still doesn't want to move forward. He still can't quite figure out why his heart is not letting him go, and he stays stuck. And so the question is, what is holding him back? I would encourage you today to take a look within. What might be holding you back from taking that next step in your walk with God, from taking that next step in your marriage, from taking that next step in your parenting? What might be holding you back? Because today, as we look to Exodus chapter 4, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show us from the text, from Scripture, four reasons why we might stay stuck spiritually. Uh, Would that be all right this morning? I want to give us four reasons why we might stay stuck spiritually. If you're taking notes, the first one is this. We worry about scenarios outside of our control. Often we stay stuck because we worry about scenarios that are outside of our control. Let's pick up our text in verse number one. The Bible says this, and Moses answered and said, but, he says, but, Behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Uh, Moses says, God, I can't go. Why? Because they're not going to believe me. Now, what's interesting about this excuse 
is that the Lord told him in Exodus chapter 3, verse number 18, one chapter before, and they shall hearken to thy voice. And so the Lord said, they will hearken to your voice. They will listen to you. They will respond to you. They will believe you. And Moses says, but what if they don't? But God, essentially, what if you are wrong? Moses is playing a dangerous game that often we play. It's the what if game. It's what if they don't believe me? And what if this makes me look foolish? And what if people uh, don't like me? And Moses is staying stuck in a scenario that he has created in his own mind. What is he anxious about in verse number one? The people and the future, both of which are outside of our control. We cannot control people and we cannot control the future. And yet that is often exactly where we stay stuck. That is often what we are so anxious about. And we can conjure up these scenarios in our minds that cause us to be so worried and it brings stagnation into our lives. Jesus said this in Acts chapter one, verse number seven. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Now that's, that, that's a convicting verse. Excuse me. He says, it is not for you to know the times uh, or the seasons. That frustrates us because if you're like me, you want to know the times or the seasons. Uh, You want to know the detail. You want to know the schedule. You want to know the itinerary. But Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. But then he goes on and he says, which the father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so Jesus gives us a word of encouragement this morning. He says, you won't always have access to my plan, but you do always have access to my power. And so instead of worrying about something that is outside of your control, how about you start accessing what is in your uh, arena, and that is the power of God through the Holy Spirit of God. And so rather than playing the what if game, what if they don't like me, and what if I lose my job, and what if the economy gets worse, and what if I can't move forward, how about start asking this question, what if I were to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God? What would happen if I was totally surrendered and totally yielded to whatever God wanted me to do? Rather than worrying what's outside of my control, how about let's put our faith and confidence in the one who is in control. His name is Jesus Christ, and he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Often, we can put a question mark where God puts a period. But, you know, so many plain commands in Scripture go into all the world and preach the gospel. But what if? But what if? And often there is reluctance where there should be obedience. Now, I want you to notice how the Lord responds uh, to this worry. Notice it in verse number two. Everybody still with me today? Notice verse two. And the Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. Now, the Lord asked him this question, what is that in thine hand? Now, the Lord in his omniscience, he already knew. But he's about to teach something to Moses, that is very powerful. He says, what is in your hand? And Moses says, a rod, thank you. Now, uh, this morning, I have a rod with me. This rod is from straight up Lytle Creek, California, from Seth's backyard. So Seth, uh, thank you for bringing this for us this morning. And so the Lord says, what is in your hand? And Moses says, a rod. Now, remember, everybody with me today? Remember, Moses was a shepherd. A shepherd typically carried with them two things. A shepherd would carry a staff, and when you think of a shepherd, you might picture a staff with the curvature at the end. This was used to uh, rescue sheep and pull them out, out of, different of different places, places and, 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 to, and to guide them. So, so a, a, shepherd a shepherd would carry a staff, but often they would also carry a rod. And a rod was a st- essentially just a stick that was used for fending off the enemy. And so if a pack of wolves came and someone was trying to attack those sheep, they would take that rod, they would take that stick uh, to fend off Uh, the enemy. That is why David in Psalm 23 says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It's it's the staff that uh, provides guidance and comfort. It's the rod that provides uh, protection and comfort. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And so the Lord says to Moses, what is in your hand? What's in your hand? He says, a stick. (laughs) It's not that impressive, but a stick in the hands of a shepherd becomes a tool. What's in your hand? See, Moses grew up as the prince of Egypt. He grew up with a scepter in his hand. But the Lord didn't want to use the scepter. The Lord wanted to use the stick. 
He says, what's in your hand, Moses? And he said, it's just a stick. But all throughout scripture, we see this principle that God wants to use what's already in our hands. David just had a piece of leather in his hand, but God used that to be a sling to take out the giant. Samson, all he had in his hand was the jawbone of a donkey, and God used what was in his hands to take out a thousand Philistines. The little lad in the New Testament located near the Sea of Galilee, all he had in his hand was five loaves and two fishes, but God used what was in his hands to feed the 5,000 plus men, uh, plus women and children. See, God can use what's already in our hands. And so the question that I have for you today is, what's in your hand? What has God given you? What has God blessed you with? What opportunities has God given you? What positions has God given you? Maybe God has put in your hand a spiritual gift that you can use for his glory. Maybe he's put in your hand the ability to sing. Maybe he's put in your hand the ability to give. Maybe he's put in your hand the ability to be generous or the ability to encourage. What has God placed in your hand? Because I believe that God wants to use what's already been available to us. Now, you might say, well, what's the big deal uh, about the stick? And what's the big deal about the rod? I think you're kind of reading uh, too much into this. I don't think so, because notice what our text says in verse number 20. Notice what it says. And Moses took his wife and his sons, and he set them upon an ass or a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hands. All of a sudden, that stick got a new nickname. It was no longer just the stick. It was the rod of God. And God would use just a simple stick in the hands of Moses to part the Red Sea. And God would use a stick in the hands of Moses to strike a rock and water would come bursting forth. And God would use just a stick in the hands of Moses to be lifted high so that they would secure a victory over the enemy. See, God can use even a stick if he wants to. And so whatever opportunity God has given you, whatever talent God has given you, whatever gift God has given you, it might not seem like much from an outward perspective, but never forget, God can use even a stick. What's in your hand, Moses? He says, a rod. And then God tells him in verse number three, throw the rod on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and we'll leave that there for a second. And notice what it says in verse three. Cast it on the ground, and he cast it on the ground and became... And he became a serpent, and Moses fled from before it. Now, this leads us to our second reason we stay stuck. We allow fear to call the shots. Moses does what I think you and I would do. We throw the stick on the ground. It becomes a snake. And Moses, I love that the Bible says he fled. He ran away from it. He was like, whoa, I'm out of here. And he ran to the other side. Moses was a little bit fearful of snakes. I don't know about you. I'm not a big snake person. And so if a snake were to appear on this stage, I probably would run away as well. A few months ago, we had um, the reptile man come to Rock Hill Kids. And uh, I think we have a picture of my daughter, Blakely, uh, this morning. And she got to hold this snake. And uh, I'm thankful that I never went over there. So I never even saw this because I probably would have said, no, get get thee behind me, Satan. You know, get that snake away. And... uh, And she held that snake. I'm not a big snake person, so I can't can't blame Moses for, for running away. But what I find interesting is what the Lord told him to do next. Moses ran away. So you got a picture. Moses over here. Snake's over there. The Lord tells him to do this in verse number four. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. Now, I'm not a snake handler. You might know that. I don't know a lot about snakes, but what I do know is you probably don't want to pick up a snake by the tail because that snake can whip around and bite you. And so if you're going to pick up a snake, you got to pick it up by the head. You know what I'm talking about, Leon? you got to pick it up by the head because then it's not going to be able to bite you. And so to pick it up by the tail can be very dangerous, and yet that's exactly what the Lord told Moses to do. Pick it up by the tail. What is God doing? He's asking Moses to do something that is outside of his comfort zone. He's asking Moses to do something that might produce some fear uh, in him. One of the reasons we stay stuck is because we allow fear to call the shots and we're never willing to venture beyond the realm of our own comfort zone. Don't you find it fascinating that the Lord is telling Moses to reach for what he had been running from? If you want to get victory, if you want to move forward and get unstuck, sometimes you have to face your fears right in the face. Sometimes you have to be willing to have that uncomfortable conversation that you've been avoiding. You have to forgive that person that you've been holding on to bitterness with. 
You have to be willing to take a step of faith even when it makes you feel uncomfortable. We have to reach for often what we have been running from. But I'm thankful today that the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm thankful today that God has not given us that spirit of fear, but he wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. Even when it might be outside of our comfort zone. Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Can I tell you in 2024, what will the economy look like? Be not afraid. Hey, what will the election look like? Be not afraid. Hey, what's going to happen in our country? Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest, and one plus God is always the majority. And so we don't have to move forward this year in fear. We can move forward in faith and in confidence knowing that God is in control. Now, notice what happens in verse 4. And the Lord said, Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and he caught it. He obeyed and it became a rod in his hand. And so God is showing him. Don't miss this. Everybody with me today? God, God's showing him his power. He's giving him a sign, a demonstration. Pick it up. And it became a rod in his hand. That was a step of faith. God showing him his power. But can we dive a little bit deeper this morning? Notice what it says in verse 5. That they may believe that the Lord, God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. He's giving him confidence. This is what I want you to see. I want to go a little bit deeper. Not only do I believe God is showing him a sign of his power, he's also showing Moses a sign of his authority. Because Moses was very familiar with the customs and the rituals of Egypt. And in Egypt, snakes were very common. In fact, in Egypt, a cobra was considered a god. If you recall a picture of Pharaoh, what is on Pharaoh's image? A snake. When you went to Egypt, everywhere you would look, you would see snakes. You would see inscriptions, you would see them on helmets, you would see them in hallways, you would see them all over the place because they believe often that snakes were divine. And so I believe that God is showing Moses not only his power, but he's showing Moses his authority, his authority over snakes, his authority over Pharaoh, his authority over evil, his authority over Satan, his authority over Egypt. Can I remind you today that he alone is in control and he has authority over all of his creation. And so he's showing Moses who's really in control. And so Moses, when you walk back into Egypt and you see all those snakes, just know who has the authority. And this reminds me of the first gospel mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse number 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And watch this promise in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, Eve, and between thy seed and her seed. And when he says her seed, he's talking about the one that would eventually come through Eve. He's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about Jesus Christ. This is a prophecy concerning Jesus. And there will be enmity between thy seed and her seed. And it, her seed shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This prophecy is concerning the cross of Jesus Christ. And this prophecy is concerning the empty tomb. And what he's saying is because of the cross and the empty tomb that Jesus Christ has crush the head of Satan and that he is victorious once and for all. And so I want to encourage you today, the next time that you are fearful, just remember we're on the winning side, that he has crushed the head of Satan. He is in control. He has the authority today. And so he is demonstrating his power for, for Moses. But God, in his graciousness, he doesn't, just, he doesn't just stop with the snake. He goes on. Notice it in verse number six. He goes on and it says this, and the Lord said, furthermore, Unto him, put now thine hand into thine bosom, or your cloak. And he put his hand into his bosom, his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. So the Lord told Moses, he puts his hand in his jacket, and he pulls it out, and now his hand is white as snow, it's leprous. This would have also been very scary. If this would have stayed, it would have spread to his whole body. It would have changed Moses' his whole life. He wasn't going to be able to go and be near anyone. And so Moses was 
looking at this like this is not good. Verse 7, and he said, put thine hand into thine bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And so uh, he puts it back in and pulls it out. And now his hand is good to go again. And, and why did the Lord tell him to do this? What was the point? Verse 8, and it shall come to pass if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. God says, so if they don't believe uh, you when you show them the snake, then show them uh, this uh, hand miracle, this hand sign, and then they will believe you. And if they don't, he goes on and he gives another sign in verse number 9. It says this, and it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee also with these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, the Nile, and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. And so the first two signs were signs of transformation. They were signs of life. The third sign was a sign of judgment. And he says, if they don't listen to the first two signs, then maybe they'll listen to a warning and a sign of judgment. And so he is, he is graciously giving Moses these signs to validate the message. Now, you might be thinking today, well, that would be nice. What is our sign? What, what, how can we validate our message? And Moses got to see the snake trick, and Moses got to see uh, his hand put in his jacket and turn leprous and back again. It was whole again. And what do we have as a sign? Can I tell you? Are you with me today? We have the greatest sign of them all. The Bible says this in Matthew chapter 12, verse number 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man, Jesus, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The sign that we have is the greatest sign of them all. The sign that we have is the sign of the empty tomb. Can I tell you that he is not there? He is risen. He is alive and well today. And this provides confirmation and validation for our faith. You can go today and you can visit the burial place of Muhammad. You can go and visit the burial place of Abraham. I've been there. You can go and visit these places, but they're not exactly sure where Jesus Christ of Nazareth was born. They think they know where it is, but they're not exactly sure. Why? Because Jesus didn't stay there. He is alive and well today, and we have confidence knowing that our God lives. And so what is our sign? It's the empty tomb. And so the Lord in his graciousness is giving these signs to Moses. We often worry about scenarios that are outside of our control. We allow fear to call the shots. Let me give you the third reason today that we often don't move forward. Number three, we can't see past our own inadequacy. Often we don't move forward and we don't experience a fresh start because we can't see past our own inadequacy. Notice what Moses says in verse number 10. It says this, and Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And so even after all three miraculous signs that God gave him, Moses still stayed stuck. He still said, I I'm not eloquent of speech. I'm slow of tongue. It literally can be read, I have a heavy mouth. Like, I, like I can't, I'm not good with words. I'm not eloquent. I, I don't know what to say. And, you know, according to some ancient Egyptian documents that have been discovered, eloquence was considered a premium in Egyptian culture. They, they valued this. And Moses would have been familiar with that. And so he thought, I, I can't speak well. They're not going to listen to me. But you know what's interesting about this? In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 7, verse number 22, Stephen is preaching a message in the New Testament, and he's preaching about Moses. And this is what he says in Acts 7, 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in, what is it? Words. And in deeds. So Stephen's preaching about Moses. Moses was mighty in words. Interesting, Moses says, I can't speak well. And so maybe it wasn't so much about his inability as it was about his insecurity. I don't think that I have it in me. Moses couldn't see past his own inadequacy. See, Moses had been in the desert for 40 years, and he wasn't talking to a whole lot of people those 40 years. Uh, he was talking to a lot of sheep for 40 years, and so he didn't feel real confident in going leading public uh, crowds. And so Moses, I don't know if I have it in me. I don't know if I can speak well. You know, the Apostle Paul had a similar statement in the, in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 1, and I, brethren, when I came into you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Uh, Paul said, it wasn't because I was so impressive as a communicator. He says, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Paul said, if there's anything that I want to be remembered for, it's that I preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what it was all about. It wasn't about eloquence or fancy words. It was about Jesus. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but rather in the power of God. And so Paul says, I'm not discouraged by my own inadequacy. Paul recognized the principle that the inadequacy of man is simply making space for the sufficiency of God. That God wanted to use Moses because of his weakness so that he could get the greater glory in his life. And so Moses says, I can't speak. Well, notice how the Lord responds. Verse number 11 says this. And the Lord said unto him, who hath made man's mouth? What a convicting question. The Lord's like, Moses, you think I'm surprised by your inadequacy? I created you. I made you. I know everything about you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so your perceived weakness, your perceived inadequacy, it does not come as a surprise to me. I know everything about you. I made you. I created you. And and I love you. And then he goes on and he says this in verse 11. Or who maketh the dumb or the deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? This is a staggering statement concerning the sovereignty of God. Now, bear with me for a moment. We know that we live in a broken and fallen world. And in a broken and fallen world, there is sin, there is sickness, there is infirmity, there is disease. But the Lord is saying, you are fearfully and wonderfully made And I have a purpose even in your infirmity. I have a purpose even in your pain. And I want to use you to demonstrate how great I am, that I can use the deaf, the mute, the blind. I can use whoever I want to use to accomplish my purpose for their lives. There's a great example of this in the New Testament in John chapter 9. There's a beautiful picture of this. John chapter 9, verse number 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. So, They pass by, here's a man who's blind from his birth. He was born this way. And his disciples asked him a common question. They said, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents? They just assumed that because this man was born blind, somebody somewhere messed up. Who sinned? Was it his parents or was it him? Whose fault is this? This is the age-old question. Why is there suffering? Why would a good God allow Evil and suffering. So why was this man born blind? Was it his parents or was it him? Notice what Jesus says. Neither. How do you like that for an answer? Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. It wasn't because of his sin or his parents. It's because I have a big plan for this man's life. I have a purpose for this man's life. And my power is about to be showcased through his life. Uh, This man is about to uh, show and manifest the glory of God. Why? He has a purpose even in his situation. And so he tells Moses, hey, your excuse isn't going to carry a lot of weight uh, with me because I know everything about you, and I want to use you in spite of your perceived inadequacy. Notice what it says in verse 12. Now, therefore, go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. And so he says, hey, go forward. Stop using this as an excuse. I will be with you. Move forward. Now, after all that, Moses still stays stuck. And I want you to see the fourth reason we stay stuck. Number four, we are unwilling to accept the assignment. Now, this is where we really get to the heart of the matter. This is really the heart of what's going on in Moses' life. life. Notice verse number 13. And he said, O Lord, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him. In other words, someone else. Send, I pray thee, by the hand of someone else whom thou wilt send. What, What is Moses saying in verse number 13? Lord, send someone else. I remember my very first Little League baseball game. I remember I was playing in the Lancaster Little League, and I was playing for the Cincinnati Reds, and I was excited about that first game, but I was also a little bit nervous about that first game because it was the first game that it wasn't coach pitch, and it wasn't uh, t-ball. It was player pitch, and so I remember sitting there on the bench, and it was our turn, uh, our team's turn to bat, and uh, it was my turn to bat, but I told uh, the kids sitting next to me, my team, I said, you go ahead of me. And so he was like, all right. And so he went out ahead of me, and uh, he went up to bat. And uh, when the ump uh, saw him, when the umpire saw him, he stopped the whole game, and he says, hey, this is not the right order. 
We're looking for a Matthew Chapel. And everybody kind of turned to look to me, and I was like, oh, me, my turn, you know? And so uh, then I was like, all right, and I got up to bat, and I was kind of nervous, and uh, the pitcher uh, pitched the ball, and I swung as hard as I could, and I hit the slowest ground ball that you can imagine to first base. It was barely getting there. But thank the Lord, the first baseman was tying his shoe because the ball went right by him. And so I was able to go, and I rounded first base, and I went to second base. I looked, and I don't know what was happening, but they didn't have anybody in the outfield. And so I rounded second base, third base, and I hit a home run on my first at bat in Little League for the Cincinnati Reds. I still have the Little League card to prove it. One day, I'm going to show my son Luke, and he'll probably not be impressed still. But it almost didn't happen because I didn't want to accept the assignment. My thought was, let somebody else go. I'm nervous. You go. Moses says, let somebody else go. He didn't want to go. And now we get, please hear me, now we get to the real heart of the matter. All of these excuses that Moses was giving were just superficial. They were just shallow. Please hear me. The real reason that was in Moses' heart was simple. He didn't want to go. It wasn't because of his speech. It wasn't because he was concerned what might happen. The real reason is he simply in his heart didn't want to go send somebody else. And so often the reason that we don't move forward and the reason that we don't get unstuck is not because we are unable, it's because we are unwilling. If I'm being honest, I might not say it out loud, but I just don't want to go. I just don't want to give. I just don't want to serve. I just don't want to be involved. I just don't want to take the time to invest in my marriage. I know that I could do better as a parent, but I'm tired. And I, just, I just don't feel like it. I just don't want to. And this is exactly where Moses was. Send somebody else. Watch how the Lord responds. Verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. God got angry. Watch this. God didn't get angry when Moses said, I don't know if they'll believe me. God didn't get angry when Moses says, who should I say sent me? God didn't get angry with Moses when he says, I can't speak well. God got angry with Moses when he was unwilling to accept the assignment. When he said, send somebody else. And so the Lord, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, verse 14. And he said, is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, verse 15, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. And so he says, okay, you're worried because you can't speak well. Fine, your brother Aaron, he can speak well. Go ahead and have him speak on your behalf. And the Lord sends Aaron with Moses. But if you keep reading in the book of Exodus, sending Aaron with Moses turned out to be a little bit of a headache for Moses. <laughs> Because if you remember, Moses is up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments from the Lord. Guess who's leading a golden calf worship service down at the bottom of the hill? Aaron. He was the one instigating it. He was the one leading it. Later on in the book of Numbers, guess who was trying to lead a mutiny against Moses? It was Aaron. Hey, be careful what you ask for, because you just might get what you want, but it won't be what you thought. Now here is Aaron. And Moses is like, man, I wish I wouldn't have said that about not speaking well. I can speak just fine. Now, we come to the last verse that I want to read this morning, verse 18. And I really want you to lean into it. It says this, and Moses went. Three words, and Moses went. And Moses went. Now, the significance of this is this. He finally got unstuck. He finally said, okay, I'm going to go back to Egypt. I'm going to go tell my father-in-law I need to go. And so what Moses did is he got unstuck and he went and he saw the plagues and the rest is history. And he went into the wilderness and he saw God part the Red Sea. He saw the fire in the sky and the pillar of the cloud uh, in the sky. Uh, he saw God do some wonderful, miraculous things later on in the New Testament when Peter, James, and John go with Jesus up into the Mount of Transfiguration. Guess who shows up and has a conversation? conversation with Jesus, Moses. But he never would have seen it if he would have stayed stuck. He, he never would have experienced all of it if he would have said, I, I just don't think I have it in me. Send someone else. I'm not going to go. But see, Moses pictures for us today a liberator. He went on to liberate the people of Egypt. He pictures for us a mediator. 
for the people of Egypt, mediated on their behalf before God. He pictures for the people of Israel a deliverer, uh, delivering them from captivity. And can I tell you that Moses points us ahead to a greater liberator, a greater deliverer, and a greater mediator, and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus is our liberator. He is our deliverer. He is our redeemer. He is our mediator. There is one God and one man and one mediator between God and man. It's the man Christ Jesus. And so today, we're not just learning about Moses. Ultimately, all of scripture points to one person, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, I believe today, is is standing with arms open wide, ready to forgive any one of their sins that will come to him ready to offer rest, ready to offer a fresh start, ready to offer deliverance, ready to offer forgiveness. The only question is, will you put your faith in him? The Bible says this in Romans 6, 22, now being made free from sin. Anybody at the 930 service thankful that we are free from sin, no longer entangled in bondage any longer. We're free from sin and become servants to God. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end of it, it's everlasting life. For the wages of sin, it's death. Sin has a high price tag, eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Redeemer, our Savior, our Liberator. And Today, if you don't know him, you can place your faith in him and you can experience freedom. You can experience the forgiveness of your sins. You can experience a fresh start and a new beginning and your life will be changed forever. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning.